Okay. All right, I think I got it. Let's see if it stays. Son of a... Parnell, please stop recording before I'm ready. Hello, my name is Seymour Bigwood and I am the Dean of Fire Emblem University. In today's episode, you are going to be learning about math and more specifically, how to play Fire Emblem 1 and 11. And your instructor today is going to be Professor Bigelow. He's a knowledgeable guy, very great, really smart, but he isn't much of a people person, especially when it comes to what he calls stupid questions. So if it can be avoided, guys, try not to ask questions at all, just to avoid that red tape altogether. But anyway, guys, without further ado, class is in session. Welcome to Fire Emblem University. shall shine across the generations now and for all time fire emblem heroes bring us hope's light journey from distant worlds to still the coming light what's up name's Bigelow but my students call me Professor. You would do well to remember it. And this? This is an F. You're gonna be very well acquainted with this thing soon. Anyway, I'm gonna be your math instructor for Fire Emblem 1 and 11. For the most part, we're just gonna be talking about how to play these games and how they work. One bit of a heads up I wanna give you is that each game tends to be more intricate than the last, so try to keep up. There's only one rule to this class, though. No stupid questions. What did I just say? Put it down. Anyway, is everybody good? Alright, let's go. Gonna need this. Alright, we're gonna go ahead and start with the basics. Never mind. That's too advanced for you. You people are too basic for the basics, but don't worry. I'll get you there. In the meantime, we're gonna have to start lower. So here's how the game works. You assume control of Marth and his army with the goal being to seize the objective in each chapter. You have to place your units strategically to wipe out all the enemies or as many as you can along the way. This aspect applies to a good amount of the games released throughout the franchise, but each game introduces something different to help keep things fresh. In FE1 and Eleven's case, these games are quite different from each other in regards to the gameplay. We'll start with the first one. Throughout the adventure, Marth is able to recruit new allies as he goes. To do this, you can either talk to an enemy with a specific character, visit a village with Marth himself, or ensure that a certain character survives a specific chapter. The game offers you several units of varying classes, each of them having their own strengths and weaknesses. Here I'm going to be talking about each class and what they should be doing in battle, so be sure to take notes, this is going to be on the test. Our first class is Lord. This will always be the protagonist of the game, in this case, Marth. Just for future reference though, not every game's main character will be this specific class. However, it is the most common. Lords can specialize in a multitude of things depending on the game, so for Marth, He's nothing special, really. He's the only one that can wield falchion and visit villages, and that's about it. He doesn't promote, unlike the rest of the units in the game, and if he dies, that's game over for you. So, try not to let that happen. Next class is Mercenary. Mercenaries are footlocked soldiers who specialize in swordplay. They generally have good skill, speed, and strength. However, they're lacking when it comes to defending themselves. Not a bad unit to have around. Next up is Hero. These are promoted mercenaries and the same rules still apply. Footlocked with specialization in swords. As a heads up, future games allow them to wield axes as well. If you like mercenaries, then you'll like heroes. Not much else to say. Up next we have the Thief class. This is a very weak unit in both offense and defense. They do, however, have high speed and skill, making it difficult for them to be hit. Their main perk is the fact that they can open up a treasure chest without needing a key to do so. Honestly, you're better off benching this unit unless you need them for treasure hunting. Especially in this game and the remake, because once you have the binding shield, Marth can do all that for you. Next class is Fighters. These guys are similar to the mercenaries in a way. The main difference being that instead of using swords, they use axes, which are much less accurate. They do well in defense and attack, but lack in speed and skill. They also don't do too well against magic. 
If raised properly, they can be a real beast on your team. The sixth class is Pirate. Like fighters, they wield axes, and truth be told, there is virtually no difference between them and a fighter. The most notable difference is that they can walk on water like Jesus Christ. Not a bad unit to have around for the walking on water aspect, but their movement is cut when doing so, so don't expect to walk across an entire ocean in a timely manner. Best to keep them on land and cross small patches of water when needed. Up next we have archers. Does it sound self-explanatory? Well, that's because it is. These guys shoot arrows and can attack from a distance with no risk of counterattack. However, they are vulnerable up close. They usually have high speed and skill, but lack in defense against both physical and magical attacks. They're also super effective against flying units, but more on those in a second. Archers tend to have their usefulness, and if you can keep them out of harm's way, they are pretty essential to the team. Well, depending on the game, of course. Archers promote into what is called sniper units. These guys are just like archers in every aspect. A key difference being is that they can also walk on water just like pirates. Yes, go ahead. You want to know why? Because video games. Can I get back to the lesson, please? Is that okay with you? Look, snipers excel at everything that archers do, and since they're promoted, they're better. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Take them with you if you can. You won't be sorry. An alternate to archers in this game is hunters. Remember how I said archers don't have very good defense? Well, hunters have even worse defense, but they make up for it in strength. They don't promote in the first game, so realistically you're better off with an archer since it can become a sniper. But it couldn't hurt to experiment with them if you want. Could be a nice meat shield for you. If you haven't had enough archer goodness, this game also offers bow knights. These are generally promoted hunters in later installments, but here it's just an archer on a horse. They have a wider range of movement and have all the perks of being an archer and a social knight. In general, they're good units to have around and they can keep up the pace with your other units. They will more than likely not kill an enemy on the first turn, so they can help sneak in a pot shot or two to weaken the enemy for another unit to kill. Our next class is Social Knight. This unit is only in the first game. Nowadays, they're called Cavaliers. This is a mounted unit on horseback that can travel a great distance and wield swords and lances. They have decent offense and defense, but lack in magical defense. Just about every game has at least two of these units at your disposal, but in this game in particular, they're good at leading the charge into enemy lines. While they navigate on land perfectly fine, they have a much harder time navigating through forests and deserts and can't cross mountains at all. This applies to every horse mounted unit, just keep that in mind. Now we have Paladins. These are promoted cavaliers and have the same characteristics as them. Only real difference is that they can move farther and have slightly better magic defense. Ideally, you want to promote your cavaliers into these guys as soon as you can. Because while they're similar in every way to cavaliers, they are also more powerful, hence the term promoted unit. That does it for our horse mounted units, so now let's discuss armor knights. These are units with high defense and attack, but have pitiful speed and magic resistance in conjunction with not being able to move very far. These units are perfect meat shields, but if raised correctly, they can also be viable units as well. Oddly enough, this unit does not promote an FE1 despite there being the existence of our next unit, Generals. Generals would later become promoted armor knights, and just like paladins, they're superior to their predecessor in every way. They still lack in magical defense, but they can also move farther, and their offense and defense increases exponentially. They still act as a shield more than anything, but they will be valuable to hold the line if your other units are getting wounded. And now we get to the flying units. In this case, we have the Pegasus Knight. These units are able to travel anywhere on the map, and they can cross water, mountains, forests, everything. However, they have a flaw, a pretty substantial one. They have terrible attack and defense, but make up for it in speed and skill. In later games, they also have decent magic resistance as well. Pegasus Knights are fragile, but they do have their uses, and later games make them pretty key to your success. Next, we have our final flying unit in the game, Dragon Knights, which would later be called Draco Knights or Wyvern Riders, depending on the game. In FE1, these are promoted Pegasus Knights and are almost completely opposite to the former. They can still travel larger distances and overall types of terrain, but unlike Pegasus Knights, their offense and defense is pretty unmatched. They don't have as much speed or skill, and their magic resistance is abysmal, but they are more than capable of holding the line. If you recall what I said earlier, both of these flying type units are weak to archers, so keeping them clear is very wise. Up next is... Oh, shut up, brats. There's only a few more left. Anyway, as I was saying, 
The next class is Shooter. Probably the most out of place thing in this entire game. So out of place that they no longer exist. Instead, they're called Ballista Units, but we'll come back to that. The Shooter Units are basically armored archers. Take the horrible movement of the Armor Knights and combine it with the ability to attack from a distance, and now you have Shooters. Not exactly a terrible unit, but considering that archers kind of need to be up in the action has significance, don't be surprised if you bench this class. Defense doesn't do much good if they're all the way in the back. Now, we've talked a lot about magic, so now let's get into where that comes from. This is a mage. It's a magic-wielding class that uses magic from books, or tomes, to strike down its foes. They have no strength or defense, and in this game it tends to be complicated when determining how much damage they'll do, but we'll get to that later. Like archers, you'll need to keep these units clear of danger, but unlike archers, they not only can attack from a distance, but they can also attack up close. If you're trying to kill an enemy in a hurry, mages have you covered because everything in this game has bad resistance. Next magic class we have is Cleric. These units are used as healers and nothing more. All of their stats are terrible and you would be a fool to have them anywhere near the front lines. They cannot fight back at all, so having them free from danger is wise. The final magic class we have is Bishop. In FE1, a bishop is a promoted cleric or mage, so they come with the perks of both classes. They can shoot magic at your enemies and heal your allies. And since it's a promoted unit, they're superior in every way. Worth keeping alive, to say the least. Then we have the Commando class. That's what it's called in Japan, anyway. Here in the States, they're called Freelancers. These units can transform into another character in your army for a short period of time. They're not perfect, but they can be helpful when the time arises. I wouldn't expect to get much mileage out of them, though, because when they decide to transform back, it can happen at very inopportune times. Use them if you're feeling bold. And finally, our last class in FE1 is Manichaeans. These units are able to transform into a dragon and dish out loads of pain. They're not a unit to be trifled with. When transformed, all their stats increase exponentially, making them a force to be reckoned with. Keep in mind, though, that they cannot transform without a dragon stone, and if it's gone, eh, they're basically as useless as clerics in battle. Alright, that does it for the classes in the original. So now, allow me to talk about the classes in the remake. For the most part, they're all the same. However, there were some additions and some changes made so that this game will play more like a modern-day Fire Emblem game, but it still tries to stay true to the original as much as possible. The new inclusions start with the Falcon Knight. This is a secondary promotion to the Pegasus Knight. Using a specific item, you can turn a Pegasus Knight into this class, and in terms of performance, they're pretty much the same. In the remake's case, Pegasus Knights have decent magic resistance, so you can expect that the Falcon Knights expand on that, among other traits. This game also offers us the Myrmidon, a sword fighting class that specializes in speed and skill, but lacks in power and defense. This class is hard to hit, and they get critical strikes more often than not, so they can be helpful in a pinch, but I wouldn't advise placing all your chips on them. While they can get several critical hits, there's still a chance that they won't, so be sure to plan around that setback. Now we have the Swordmaster. These units are promoted Myrmidons, and as such, they have all the same perks as them. Seeing as how they are promoted, though, they will hit harder, take more hits, and have an even higher chance of landing a critical hit. Pretty valuable ally, but be careful with them. Since fighters didn't promote in the old game, the new game offers us the Warrior. This class has been around for quite some time at the point of this game's release, and they perform no differently than the other games. They hit hard, take a lot of damage, and have a lot of health in some cases. If raised properly, they can have a very low chance of missing an attack, and with their speed being above average, they can also double attack enemies. Aside from axes, they can also wield bows. All in all, a solid unit and worth having at least one of them. Just like fighters, pirates didn't have a promotion in the old game either. However, in the remake they do, which is called a berserker. Think of them as a warrior, only they're locked to axes and can still walk on water. Their stats increase tremendously when promoted from pirate, and while they're still weak to magic, they still hold their own in battle against everything else. Magic at this point in time had received quite a few changes, which of course we'll be getting to when the time comes. All you need to know for this game in particular is that the magic users are now split. Mages still cast elemental magic and clerics still heal, but this game also offers us the Dark Mage. Dark Mages are no different than a normal mage in regards to stats, but they wield dark magic instead of elemental. Dark magic tends to be hard hitting, but is also less accurate. Whether or not these units are worth raising is up to interpretation. Some people love them, some people hate them. I'd say give them a shot and see what you think. 
A Dark Mage's promoted form is Sorcerer. This class has all the same perks as a Dark Mage and can wield stabs on top of magic tomes. Since everything about them improves overall, they're worth keeping around. A promotion to mages are sages, and they're pretty much the same thing as a sorcerer. The only difference is that they wield elemental magic and stabs. This class is highly advised to have around. Clerics in this game became locked to females, with males becoming a curate. They are entirely the same, though. They cannot fight, but they can heal your allies instead, and they both promote into a bishop, which we already discussed. If you recall when we talked about the shooter class, I mentioned ballista as well. Well, that's where this class comes in, the ballistikin. This class uses Ballista to shoot enemies from much farther away than the average archer. They can't move more than a few spaces at a time and are very vulnerable up close, but they're useful when dealing with large amounts of enemies. Just use them to take the enemy's health down little by little so your frontline allies have an easier time. And that, folks, is every single class in both the Famicom and DS Remake games. I know there's quite a lot, and I have good news. Later games reuse most, if not all, of these classes and have very few differences between them, so we won't need to talk about them again, in theory. So let's get into the games themselves. When in battle, a character can do one of several things, and that would be move, use an item, talk, attack, or wait. Using whichever will cause the unit to be grayed out, meaning they can no longer be used for the duration of that turn. The most common thing you're going to do is attack, so let's talk about what influences battle properties. Each character has several stats and all of them vary between each unit. HP is health points, or hit points depending on your interpretation. This signifies how much health a character has. Pretty standard. When a character's health reaches zero, they're out. Next is the strength stat. Strength determines how hard a character will hit. If they have high strength along with a strong weapon, they'll do a lot of damage. Some characters have higher base strength than others. An example would be Cain and Abel. Cain starts off with 7 points of strength, while Abel only has 6 despite them both being cavaliers. Now we have the skill stat. This one isn't as self-explanatory, so try to keep up. Skill influences two things, hit rate and critical hit rate. Units with high skill have an increased chance of hitting an enemy, and those with an even higher skill than that have a better chance of getting critical hits. Critical hits do triple damage, but don't be fooled. Both your units and the enemies can land them. For the most part, it's luck if it happens, but it can be either really sweet or really disheartening. The next stat is unique to the first game, and that would be the weapon level. This stat determines how strong of a weapon the unit can wield. The higher the level, the stronger the weapons. Pretty straightforward. However, in later games, the weapon level is replaced with weapon rank. This increases as the character uses a certain weapon, so the concept is still the same, but a character won't have to rely on luck to determine when they can upgrade from an iron weapon to a steel and then silver. We'll get to that though. Next up is the speed stat. This stat determines how many times a character is able to attack in a single turn. If a unit has high speed, such as a mercenary, they will likely be able to attack twice in a single battle. That is, provided that they're fighting somebody that is much slower than they are. So you can expect that a mercenary will double an armor knight since they generally have low speed. Additionally, this stat also influences character evasion. Now we have the luck stat. This stat is a little hard to summarize, so tell me if I'm talking too fast. Put your hand down. As a whole, the luck stat influences evasion and hit rate as well as reducing enemy critical hit rates. Later games play with the luck stat a little bit more, but we'll talk about those when the time comes. Classes that you can expect to have good luck is Myrmidons or Pegasus Knights as well as their promoted forms, and classes with poor luck will be Mages and Axe Fighters. Mind you, this can be subjective, some games handle luck completely differently, so it's best to just pay that stat no mind, at least until later games. Up next is the defense stat. This stat determines how much punishment a unit can take. If a unit's defense is higher than its opponent's strength, then no damage will be received when attacked. Some games still make it to where you take at least one hit point of damage, but most of the games follow this formula. Armor knights and generals typically are the defensive tanks in your army, and in FE1's case, shooters are good for defense as well. One stat that is not an FE1 is the magic stat. This stat, like strength, determines how much damage a magical attack will do when compared to a unit's magic defense. Since FE1 does not have a magic stat, instead the damage is determined by the strength of the magic itself. Only a few other games don't have this stat either, but as a whole, that's how the game works. Now we have the magic defense stat, which would later be called resistance. This stat influences how much abuse a unit can take from a magic user. 
In FE1, not a single unit except for one has any sort of magic defense. The stat is there, but nobody, not even the mages, get it as they grow. This makes magic units quite broken in the original. Luckily though, the remake and pretty much every other game since then has resistance on the character, so it helps to balance the gameplay. As a whole though, units with high res are typically magic users. Everyone else either has abysmal res or adequate res. And last but not least, we have the movement stat. This stat influences how many spaces a unit can move, but it's not gained from level ups like the other stats. Instead, it's associated with the class that the character is in. There are obstacles that cuts a unit's movement, but we'll dive to that in a moment as well. And there you have it. Those are all the stats and what they signify. Now while each class utilizes a certain stat, each character has what is called base stats and growth rates. Base stats are pretty simplistic. They're the stats that the characters come with when recruited into your army. For instance, when you recruit Harden, this is what his stats will look like. Growth rates determine what the chances are of a particular stat increasing upon a character leveling up. Let me explain, let me explain, put your hands down. No questions. Ever! When a battle concludes, as long as your unit doesn't fall, they gain experience and level up once they gain 100 XP points. When this happens, their stats increase like you'd expect from an RPG, but Fire Emblem handles things quite differently. Every time a level up happens, the game's random number generator determines which stat increases. Each character's growth varies, such as this. Magic users are more likely to have increased magic and res growth, whereas a mercenary is more likely to get strength and defense. Let me direct your attention to this right here. This is Minerva, and this is what her base stats look like. Remember, base stats are what the stats are when she's recruited to you. And these are her growth rates. Do these numbers confuse you? Yeah, I figured. So, let me explain. These numbers here represent the percentage of the chance of a stat increasing. So as you can see, Minerva has a 40% chance of HP growth in both the original and the remake. To put it simply, she has a chance to gain 1 HP for every 2-3 to three level ups on average. However, since this is determined by RNG, you could have several level ups that give her HP every time, or never at all. Sometimes you'll get lucky and have most, if not all, the stats increase, but sometimes you'll get unlucky and have little increases, if any at all, and some characters have better growth rates than others. Such as this, Kane has a total of 370% growth while Abel only has 340% in the original game. Quite a difference as you can see, which is also a bit strange considering that they're both the same class and recruited at the same time. The remake handles growths in the same way, but since there's new classes, some characters' base and growths had to be changed to match the pros and cons of each class. Such as Navarre, here is his base and growths as a mercenary in FE1, and here's his base and growths in FE11. Not a huge difference between the two, but still there. And this applies to just about every character in the remake when compared to the original. Alright, so now that we know the objective of the game, the different classes, and all the stats, let's talk now about something more advanced, namely combat. Don't worry, don't worry, this is going to be a lot more interesting, I promise. And if I catch any of you sleeping, this whole class is going to feel my wrath. Believe it or not, certain classes with certain stats are not the only thing that determines if your unit wins or loses a battle. You also have two other things to take into consideration as well, the weapon wielded by both parties and the terrain. Like I said earlier, as your units grow, their weapon level, or proficiency in the later games, increase, resulting in them being able to use stronger weapons. Each weapon has a set might, weight, hit rate, critical rate, uses, and range. In FE1, how much damage is done depends on the physical power of the attacker minus the opponent's defense. So, how is physical power determined? That one is easier than you think. You take the strength of the unit and then add the might of the weapon. So, if your unit has 10 strength and the weapon has 12 might, that means the unit has 22 physical power. And if the enemy's defense is 10, that means your unit will do 12 damage per hit in battle. Don't worry, the game figures this stuff out for you. But, it doesn't exactly tell you, so you might want to consider this stuff before you go all He-Man into battle. Magic works in the same fashion for power and damage as well. Basically, it's determined by the Magic Tome's might minus the opponent's resistance. So at FE1, how much damage a mage does with their tome rests solely on the might of the tome itself since 
No unit in this game has any resistance except for Gato, who you don't even get until the final chapter of the game, I might add. I mentioned earlier that some units will be able to attack twice in the same battle. How is that determined, you ask? Well, that's easy as well. In FE1's case, as long as your speed is greater than your foes, you will attack twice. Attack speed is determined by your unit's current speed minus the weight of the weapon. So, if your speed is 11 and the weight is 5, then your attack speed will be 6, and as long as that number is greater than your enemies, you will attack twice and vice versa. Now let's talk accuracy. Four things play a role into this. Physical accuracy in a void, and magic accuracy in a void. Physical accuracy is determined by the weapon's hit rate plus the unit's skill. So, if your weapon has 100 hit rate, and the unit has 7 skill, that means your accuracy is at 107, which, in theory, means you won't miss, right? That's where physical avoid comes in. Physical avoid is determined by the terrain bonus along with the unit's speed. So, if a unit has 10 speed and the terrain gives them an additional 20, that means that they have 30 physical avoid. So now we subtract 30 from 107 and we get a 77% chance of landing a hit. The same thing applies to magic accuracy in avoid. The difference is though is that accuracy is determined by the weapon's hit rate and avoidance is determined by luck. So if a mage has a 90 hit rate on their tome and the unit they're attacking has 10 luck, then that means there will be an 80% chance of landing a hit. So now that damage, hit rate, and accuracy is explained, what determines criticals? Well, you take the unit's skill and luck and then divide that by 2, and then add the weapon's critical hit rate if it applies. Most weapons in the game don't, but if they do, the math is simple. If a unit has 10 skill and 10 luck, that makes 20. Divide that by 2 and you get 10. If the weapon has 20 critical hit rate, then that means the unit has a 30% chance of landing a critical hit. This game also offers a curse feature. This only applies to the Devil Axe and Sword, and what it does is that it determines how much damage a unit will take after using those weapons. This is determined by subtracting the unit's luck from 21. So if the unit has 15 luck and then you subtract that from 21, that results in 6 damage being taken after the battle. Okay, so now that you know how combat works for the most part, there is one more little feature that I want to talk about. Do you recall earlier how I told you that flying units are weak to archers? Well this, my friends, is called Effective Coefficient. The same formula applies to everything we just discussed, but if you are attacking a unit that is weak to a particular weapon, you must multiply the weapon might by 3. So let's say your unit has 10 strength again and is using a weapon that contains an Effective Coefficient. We'll say that the weapon's might is 12 again, and since it has the coefficient, we need to multiply the 12 by 3, which gives us 36 total might. We then add 10 to 36, which results in 46 total physical power with an effective coefficient. There are several weapons that have this feature, and unfortunately, the game doesn't do a very good job in explaining that to you, so... Allow me. If you pick up a weapon and it has the symbol of the weapon and says anything but iron, steel, or silver, it either has a special ability or an effective coefficient. You have to use these wisely because durability is generally pretty low for these types of weapons. And speaking of durability, there isn't much to explain here. You'll see a number by the weapon and that determines how many times you can use it until it breaks. Should you miss an attack, this will not count against the weapon's durability with the exception of magic tomes. On top of bows and magic, there are also physical weapons that can be used from a distance as well, such as the hand axe or the javelin and the thunder sword. Each of these weapons are not very powerful, but they can allow you to sneak in some pot shots and make the enemies easier to kill for another unit. I should mention this too, but there are also devil weapons. These are high powered weapons that hit very hard, but come at a price. They also damage the user at the conclusion of the battle. Refer to my formula from before to figure out just how much damage is taken. And that, students, is how combat works. In the original. The remake follows the same principle, but it is modified to suit a modern-day Fire Emblem game. So, let's talk about it again, from the top. This game brings back a long-running tradition that is known as the Weapons Triangle. The Weapons Triangle is a trademark feature of the series, and it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors in a sense. There are several weapon types in the game. Lances, axes, and swords. Swords get a bonus against axes, axes get a bonus against lances, and lances get a bonus against swords. Additionally, terrain not only increases a character's ability to dodge an attack, but also their defensive properties as well. In some cases, 
The terrain will also restore health at the start of a new turn. And lastly, the game also factors in a bonus from a character's weapon rank. This is only one of three games that use this as a bonus in battle. The rest of the games treat weapon rank just like weapon level from the first game. So now we have to determine how physical power is calculated. In this game, it's calculated by the character's strength, plus the might of the weapon, times the effective coefficient if applicable. Additionally, we have to factor in the bonuses as well. So if a character has 10 strength, and the weapon they're using has 12 might, and have 3 bonus points due to being A level with that weapon type, means that their total power is 25. Remember that number. Now we have to determine the weapons triangle bonus. If you look here, there are different bonuses that apply as long as you have the advantage in combat. For instance, your character has a sword while your enemy has an axe. For the most part, this just affects accuracy, but if your character is A rank in the weapon they're using, they will also receive one extra point towards their physical power. So let's assume that the weapon level is A for this demonstration, and it gives your character one extra point. That means his or her physical power is currently at 26. So to calculate the damage, we need to factor in the physical power of the attacker minus the defense plus the terrain bonus of the enemy they're attacking times the critical coefficient if applicable. Just like the weapons triangle, terrain mostly affects accuracy. However, defense is awarded as well depending on the terrain itself. So, let's assume that the enemy is standing on a fort. As you can see, this awards them one additional defense point. So, if our power is 26 and the enemy's defense is 12, plus one extra point, that means 13 damage will be dealt in battle. Should the attacker have a weapon that is super effective against the unit they're attacking, multiply the physical power by 3, and if they get a critical hit, you multiply the damage by 3. Take everything I said just now and apply that to magic as well. It's the same thing except for magic and res being the contributors here. Since the characters actually do have magic and res stats now, magic is much more balanced than in the original. So, I see no need to elaborate further on that. Attack speed is determined in a similar way to the original. However, having higher attack speed doesn't necessarily mean that you will double attack. Let me explain. To determine attack speed, you take the speed of the character and subtract the character's weapon weight minus their strength. So let's say your character has... Hmm, we'll say 20 speed and their strength is 15. The weapon they're holding has 5 weight. So now we take the 5 weight and subtract that from 15, which equals negative 10. The game doesn't allow negative as an actual factor, so it treats it as zero. Don't ask why, I have no idea. So now we take 20 minus zero and we still get 20. That means the attack speed is 20, and if that number is 4 points or higher than the opponent's attack speed, they will attack twice. Now let's determine accuracy. Again, for the most part, it's the same, but since the remake is more intricate, it tends to be a little bit more complicated. The main difference here is the implementation of a support bonus. What are these, you ask? Well, support bonuses come from the support levels between the characters and is applied if you are standing within three squares of another character on the grid. To increase the character's supports with each other, they have to participate in the same chapters. For every chapter the characters participate in, they will receive one support point to another character they are affiliated with. Once they get enough support points, the support level increases, which improves the character's support bonus. Here's what support bonuses do. As you can see, it mostly improves hit and void, but the max level also improves performing critical hits as well as dodging them. Keep in mind folks, supports in Shadow Dragon are very non-traditional. There are no conversations and there's no way of knowing who can support with whom unless you look it up. Back on track though, accuracy is determined using this formula. Weapon hit plus skill plus luck that is divided by two plus the class bonus plus the weapon triangle bonus plus the support bonus, and finally, plus the weapon rank bonus. So allow me to demonstrate. If your character has 15 skill and the weapon he wields has a 100 hit rate, that means so far he has 115 accuracy. If his luck is 12 and you divide that by 2, that means 6 luck plays into this equation. So now we add 6 to the 115 and now we have 121 accuracy so far. This class bonus only applies to Swordmaster, Sniper, and Berserker, which I have displayed here, but we're not going to factor that into this equation. Then you add the Weapon Triangle bonus. We'll assume that the character is A rank again, which means plus 10 accuracy. So that means we now have 131 accuracy so far. Next, we factor in the Support bonus. Let's assume the character is B level support, and is within 3 squares of a character that they support with. That means we add an additional 10, giving us 141 accuracy. Finally, we factor in the weapon rank bonus. As you can see, in terms of accuracy, this applies to everything except a sword user. 
So let's assume this is an axe unit and their weapon rank is C. That means they gain an additional 5. So the total result is 146% chance of hitting the enemy. However, we still need to factor in the enemy's avoid rate. Avoid is calculated using this formula here. Attack speed plus luck divided by 2, plus terrain bonus, and plus the support bonus. Since we determined these stats before, let's apply them here as well. So the attack speed is 20, and the luck is 6, and the terrain bonus from the fort gives us an additional 15, as well as our support giving us 10 more avoid. That's a total of a 51% avoid rate. Now that we have our two numbers, 146 accuracy versus 51 avoid, we simply subtract 51 from 146, which results in a 95% chance of a successful strike. Now for everything we discussed regarding damage and accuracy, we talked about how having the weapons triangle advantage plays into this. Should you have this advantage, or rather the disadvantage, you have to subtract 5 or 10 depending on the enemy's weapon rank for accuracy. And you subtract 1 from the damage formula if you have the disadvantage and the enemy's weapon rank is A, just keep that in mind. Critical hits are also pretty simple and not too different from the original formula. The main difference is factoring in the class and support bonuses. We've already discussed all this stuff, I know, but here's one more example. To determine the critical hit rate, we must add the weapon's crit rate with the character's skill and divide that by 2, plus the class bonus and support bonuses if applicable. So let's say the weapon has a 20 crit rate and the unit skill is 10. We have to divide 10 by 2, leaving us with 5. That means our critical hit rate so far is 25. For the sake of not repeating myself, let's assume the character is not receiving a support or class bonus. That means we have a 25% chance of landing a critical hit. Critical hits can also be evaded, and that is determined by luck plus the support bonus. So let's pretend that someone is standing next to another character they support with, and the support level is... let's just say it's A. The support awards us with 5 critical evade, and let's pretend that the character's luck is 20. That means we have a 25% critical evade. So when determining critical hit, we have to take the 25 critical hit rate we got earlier and subtract that from the 25 critical evade, leaving a total of a 0% chance of a critical hit happening. In the original game, critical hits seem to happen more often than not, so this game balances it a bit better. Keep in mind, this sort of thing has been a staple of the series for quite some time at this point. And that, everyone, is how combat works in both games. As you can see, it's similar, but it's also still pretty different at the same time. The original game tends to be a bit more broken, but that is to be expected when you consider what year it was released in. Luckily, future games, including the remake, balance the gameplay much better, and they even tell you what the results of the battle might be using the calculations that we just discussed. I want you to keep in mind, though, these calculations were just for demonstration. So, who's ready for some more math, huh? Yeah, I figured you were. So now, let's talk experience. The original game is a lot easier, so we're gonna start there. You get the same amount of experience as the damage you deal to the enemies. Meaning that if you do 5 damage, you get 5 XP and so on. The limit though is that you cannot get more than 20 experience if the enemy is not defeated, so you could do 21 damage and not kill the enemy, but only get 20 XP. Make sense? Nah, I didn't think so either. Now if you do defeat the enemy, how much XP you get is determined by how much the enemy had. So, how does the game figure out how much XP the enemy possesses? Pretty simple actually. Each class has base experience as you can see here. So, a paladin has 44 experience by default. What we do now is add 1 point for every level and then subtract 1. So let's say that we have a level 10 paladin and we defeat him. That means we'll gain 53 experience. Make sense yet? As we discussed, when your character gains 100 experience, your character levels up and goes through the growth rates that we mentioned before. Considering that clerics don't fight, how exactly do they gain experience? Well, in the original, their avoid rate is the key factor here. We already figured how that stuff works, so I'm not going to talk about it again. If a cleric is put into a battle for some reason and survives, they gain experience in the same way as if they defeated the enemy that attacked them. I cannot stress this enough how unwise it is to place them anywhere near the front lines. And that is how experience works in the original game. As you can see, it's, uh, it's pretty sloppy. And again, this is to be expected when you consider the time frame that this game came from. If you're trying to level up your units efficiently, you're going to have to be very tactical when playing. So now, let's talk about how experience works in the remake. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is some complicated stuff, so no slacking, alright? 
Several things play a role in how much experience is earned in the remake, and the majority of this applies to later games too. Just a heads up, some of these games do things differently, and we'll be sure to annotate those in later classes. Anyway, in FE11, we need to determine the level difference. Sure, you can look at one unit and see that they're level 5 and the other one is 1, making that a 4 level difference, but it goes deeper than that. Let me show you. Level difference is determined by the enemy's level plus the class bonus, which is subtracted from your level plus your class bonus. If you and the enemy do not have a class bonus, then it will just be the enemy's level minus yours. So let's say the enemy level is 10 and yours is 5. That means that we have positive 5 level difference. I know, simple. Now the class bonus only applies to promoted units. If this is the case, then you need to add 15 to the unit's level, and this applies to both enemies and allies. This video has already been going on for well over a half hour now, so for the sake of time, we will not be factoring in class bonuses for this demonstration. Instead, we're going to focus on what practically every unit you receive will get. So now that we know that the level difference is plus 5, we can use that number to factor in how much experience is earned by damaging and defeating enemies. You get nothing for doing no damage, just a heads up. Anyway, here is where things get a little convoluted. You gain a mere 10 XP if the level difference is 0, negative 1, or negative 2, which means that you are at least 2 levels above the enemy that was damaged. So try to attack enemies with weaker units is what I'm saying. Other than that, XP earned is determined by 31 plus the level difference, which is then divided by 3 if the difference is greater than 0. So, we take 31 plus our 5 level difference, which makes 36, and then we divide that by 3. That means that as long as the level difference is greater than 0, we will gain 12 experience as long as the enemy survives the encounter. So now let's say that the level difference is negative 5, meaning that we are level 10 and the enemy is level 5. Now the XP is determined like this. We have to take 33 this time, plus the level difference and then divide that by 3 if the difference is less than negative 2. Since we are at negative 5 level difference, then we are indeed less than negative 2. So, we take the 33 and add negative 5, which results in us getting 28. We then divide that by 3, and so we get 9.33. This rounds up to the nearest whole number, so instead, we gain 9 experience. Did I lose you yet? Good, because now let's dive into what happens when you defeat an enemy. Here's how this works. It's not too different from what we just discussed. You gain 30 experience plus an additional 20 if the enemy is a boss or a thief, as long as the level difference is either 0, negative 1, or negative 2. So if it's not a thief or a boss, you gain 30, and then you gain 50 if it is. Since our level difference is positive 5, this will not apply to us. Since it doesn't apply, we move on to the next formula, and that will be 30 plus the level difference times 3.33 plus 20 if it's a boss or a thief. This formula applies to those whose level difference is greater than 0. So, we take 30 and add 17 to it. We got the 17 because 5 times 3.33 is 16.65, which rounds up to 17. And let's say it's a boss, so we need to add an additional 20 points. That means the unit will gain 67 experience. So now let's say our level difference is negative 5. Remember, that means we are 5 levels ahead of the enemy now. This formula is used in this particular situation. It's 37 plus the level difference times 3.33 and plus 20 if it's a boss or a thief. So we take 37 and add negative 17. We got this number because we multiplied negative 5 by 3.33, resulting in us getting negative 16.65, and then we rounded up to negative 17. So this means we now have 20, and then we add another 20 if it's a boss, so that means we get 40 experience. Keep in mind, folks, if it's not a boss or a thief, you just slash 20 off of that number. And the number constantly changes depending on the level difference, so just bear that in mind, okay? One more thing I want to discuss regarding experience is those healers again. Remember, they can't fight, so they don't gain experience in the traditional way. But they also aren't depending on surviving the encounter in this game either. So, how does it work? Well, for starters, it's not as difficult, so rest easy. First off, here is a chart explaining how it works. You can see here that it discusses the level of the healer as well as the base values of the stabs they're wielding. If the healer is not a promoted unit, then we simply subtract the number associated to the unit's level. If the healer is promoted, then we do what I just said, but also divide it by 2. This is done to ensure that healers level up fairly. So for this demonstration, let's assume we are using a non-promoted healer at level 10, wielding a physics stab. 
According to this chart, the base XP value of the physics stab is 40, which would mean a healer would gain 40 experience while using this weapon, right? Well, since our healer is level 10, that's not actually the case. We need to subtract 2 since our healer is level 10, not promoted, which leaves us with 38 experience per use of the staff. Should the unit be promoted and level 10, we need to take that 38 that we just got and divide it by 2, and that will leave us with 19 experience earned per use of the staff. Make sense? Alright, one last thing to discuss before moving forward. We talked earlier about weapon rank and weapon level and what they do in each game. And we also discussed how they increase, but the explanation for Shadow Dragon was a little vague, so let me give you a deeper explanation. Weapon level increases as you use a particular weapon, be it magic or physical, right? Well, how long does it take to rank up exactly? Honestly, it takes a while to max out, and you only get two weapon experience per battle. Even if the attack misses or does no damage, you will still get WEXP. Looking at this chart here, you can see how much experience is needed before the rank increases. So yeah, you're gonna have to fight a lot. And that, students, is literally every bit of calculations in the game. So far we've discussed the objective of the games, character classes, stats, base stats and growth rates, and calculations associated combat. Judging from how long it took to talk about it all, you can see that there's a whole lot going on here. And what's funny about all this calculations that I just did, is that the game actually determines all that stuff for you. Now, 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 don't think that I wasted all of your time. This is stuff that you actually need to know. Well, most of it anyway. And guess what else? We are still not done. So in each chapter of the game, there are quite a few other things to consider to ensure victory, such as your inventory. Each member of your team is allowed to have four items in their inventory in FE1, and you're allowed to have five in FE11. They can be weapons or items, either way, they take up a slot. In both games, you have the ability to trade weapons between the characters should they not need the item that they're holding. Of course, items can also just be discarded if you don't need them at all. Should the character's inventories be full, the items can be sent to storage which can hold up to 40 items total in the original game. If you need to store an item, you have to pay this totally not goofy looking guy at all 10 gold every time. Removing an item costs nothing, however, doing this does cost a unit a turn, so be sure to consider that. In the remake, Marth has access to the convoy which can hold up to 200 items. Each character can access the convoy by either standing next to Marth or by using the preparation screens. Both games feature a prep screen prior to each battle, but as you'd expect, the original is pretty primitive. The only purpose this screen has is to examine the map and select your units. That's it. FV11 has a lot more going on here, so let me explain. Shadow Dragon offers plenty of things to do for preparation. You can select which units you want to bring on the field, look at the map, swap your unit's starting positions, and access the convoy to transfer items between characters. You can also reclass your units if you're feeling experimental. So if you feel like turning a flyer into a foot unit, you're welcome to do so. It'll help mix things up a bit. Doing this though will decrease some of their stats, but the game will tell you what will happen before you confirm it. You can also access the army where you can buy weapons or stabs, sell your unwanted items, or forge a new weapon altogether. Forging requires you to have the weapon in your possession first, and then you can modify it to be more efficient. Meaning you can decrease the weight, make it more powerful, and increase its critical hit rate. And for grins, you can also name the weapon too. Besides all that, you can also access the game's option features to speed up text or turn off animations and lastly, save your progress. Once you select fight, you are committed, so there's no going back. Make sure you are fully prepped and ready to go before selecting fight. In the original, you can only save between chapters, however, the remake also offers save spaces that you can utilize mid-battle. This is done in the remake, so new players won't have to keep restarting an entire chapter if they lose the battle. Keep in mind though that these safe spaces are also a bit of a double-edged sword. You can easily handcuff yourself, which means you can accidentally save when in a situation where a character will inevitably die. So make sure that everyone is safe before using them. Now then, if an allied unit falls in combat, they're gone for good. Like, they're not coming back. Ever. Like when your dad left to go get milk and never came back. <laughs> I joke. Anyway, this is called permanent death, or permadeath as they say in the streets. This is one of the most defining but also most frustrating aspects of the series, and it continues until Fire Emblem 12 with the inclusion of an optional mechanic called Casual Mode. 
If the main character falls, in this case Marth, the game is over and you have to reload your save. However, if any other character should fall, the game does not have to restart. They are simply a dead soldier. Most people like to play with no casualties due to the incentive to keep them alive. The incentive is during the credit sequence where it tells us what the characters do after the war. It gives just a little bit more on screen time outside of recruitment dialogue. But you're welcome to play the game how you wish. Looking at you efficiency players, since we talked about promotions, allow me to discuss what exactly these are. Promotions require you to use a specific item on your characters to have them change into a stronger variation of themselves. Both games have this feature, but FE11 has it to where all the classes can be promoted. FE1 only has 6, and each character requires a specific item to promote. So, once a character reaches level 10, they are eligible for promotion. When a unit promotes in the original, nothing... really happens. Okay, that's not entirely accurate. What ends up happening is that the unit's base stats will increase to the class that they're promoted to, and that's if they weren't already there in the first place. Oh, and they get a cool new sprite, I guess. FE11 again is more like a modern day Fire Emblem game. Each character will turn into a stronger class and gain promotion bonuses to their stats when doing so. This is pretty much how the rest of the games do it. To promote a unit in Shadow Dragon, you need what is called a Master Seal. But, if you want to promote your Pegasus Knight into a Falcon Knight instead of a Draco Knight, you'll need an item called an Elysian Whip. Otherwise, just use a Master Seal, the game gives you plenty of them. Promotions as a whole is quite important because in most FE games, the level cap is 20, and these two games are not an exception. It should be noted though that Marth and some other characters cannot be promoted and their level cap is 30 to compensate for the fact that they can't be promoted. Promoting units helps to ensure constant growth, but of course you're at the mercy of the level up system. However, there is a way to increase stats without depending on good level ups and that would be in the form of the stat boosting items such as the speed wing or the energy drop. Each stat can be increased indefinitely with these items, so should a character be lacking in a certain trait, these items can help fill that void and you'll know if the stat is capped because it'll start glowing green. Money is obtained in several ways, such as visiting a village's Marth or selling some of your items, but the game also offers another alternative. This alternative is called the Arena. This allows you to take a character into combat where they trade blows with an enemy until one of them falls. This is also another way for you to gain level ups and weapon experience as well. Something to keep in mind though is that permadeath is in full force here, so be cautious when using this feature. This applies to both games by the way, and it uses up their turn as well. There are also some little houses that you can visit on the battlefield as well. These won't supply you with a reward or anything, they're just there to expand on the lore of the game or just give you some game tips. Again, it costs a turn to visit these places, so I would do it with caution. Features that are unique to FE11 that are not found in FE1 are Gaiden Chapters, Danger Zones, and Multiplayer. Gaiden Chapters are not a new concept for Fire Emblem at this point in time, but in Shadow Dragon, they're used as a means to recruit a new unit should you lose too many of them during your journey. If you finish a particular chapter and have less than 15 units total, then the game will automatically send you to a Gaiden Chapter to recruit a new one. Yet another way the game tries to be merciful to new players. Danger Zones are a relatively new feature at this point in time. They were introduced in the Tellius series and it shows the danger areas of the map, meaning your unit will be susceptible to attack if they are in this zone at the end of the turn. You can activate this at the touch of a button. You can also highlight specific enemies that you want to keep an eye on, and the multiplayer allows you to go head to head with another player. You can either play wirelessly by local connection or through the internet. Keep in mind the internet service for the DS no longer works, so local multiplayer is all you can do nowadays. I can't provide any footage of this because like I said, the internet service has been discontinued so you're just gonna have to bear with me here. Multiplayer works just like single player from what I could tell. You get 5 units and the goal is to either route the enemy or capture the objective. The 5 units you choose will either come in the units that you have on your save file or the game can loan you some units if you want. You also have some cards that you can utilize to help tip the scales in your favor. And that students, is how to play FE1 and FE11. Oh, thank Christ. Alright, I hope you all enjoyed this segment. Be sure to pass the test. Scram. I know you're recording, Parnell. You're not gonna get me this time. And that, students, was your math lesson for Fire Emblem 1 and 11. I know, the video was a rather lengthy one, so now I hope it makes sense as to why we broke up all these classes individually. I hope that you all watch this video at your own pace so that you can actually learn something, because above all, that's what we want. 
But anyway, the next class will be substantially shorter as we are going to be talking about music and your instructor is going to be Professor Biggins. And until that next class comes out, well, bye. That's staying the way it is. I'm not touching it anymore.